As a deer hunter, I want to know all I can about America's favorite big game animal. That's why I became a deer farmer. Without deer farms, we lose our greatest resource for research and whitetail management. With them, we gain more knowledge than ever before. Join me as we discover the truth about whitetails and meet those who work every day to preserve this great species for future generations. My name is Keith Warren and this is Deer and Wildlife Stories. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Today we've got something really special that we have never featured before. Today, we're going to tell you all about the elk farming industry. We're going to work. It's no secret that I am a, a deer farmer and I love whitetail deer. And uh, it's also no secret that I'm an avid elk hunter. I absolutely love to hunt elk. And so I was stoked about having an opportunity to be able to come out to an elk farm and learn more firsthand about elk farming. I'm Kelly Farmer. We live out here with my husband Trevor and I and our four daughters out in Balmoral, Manitoba on a beautiful elk farm. So, so this is a little male. It is yeah. a little male. And, and, and why is he pulled out now? Okay, so mom had him and did everything she was supposed to do. We tagged it, vaccinated it, left them be. A few hours later, another mom came along and had a baby right beside her. And the mom got confused and thought the new baby was hers. And they, there was this epic battle over the second calf and they just left this one alone. So when he started to falter because he hadn't been fed, we made the decision to pull him. Every time we feed him, we're ringing the bell. Just a bike bell, nothing fancy. But every time we feed him, we're ringing it. And I'm hoping he'll start to associate his feedings with the bell. My plan is to put him out in this herd by the house with mums and babies so that he's socializing. And last year I had two bull calves that we bottle fed successfully, but they did not build the muscle structure that the other calves did. Because the other calves yeah, were put probably a mile right, a day. Right, right. So that's why I'm trying this bell thing and I'm hoping that if he learns the bell means dinner, I'm gonna let him out with this. Hungry, but, well, uh, so how many times a day are you feeding? Over the first two weeks, every three hours. So how many ounces was that? Right now he's drinking about 800 mils just shy of a liter, about four times a day right now. So we want them just around 3,000 in time. Wow. You know, I look at a three-week-old whitetail, we're going to feed it three to four times a day, <laughs> yeah. depending upon how much help you've got and how many babies you've got. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but you're you're only still talking four ounces a time. There it is. It's what we do all spring. Holy smokes. Pretty cool, eh? Man. Feel that. Woo. 65 days. They grow this in 65, 65 days. days. That's the average. Oh my gosh. Okay. Alright, so this freezer is completely full of cut off antler. And they, they freeze them. They're they're frozen because they have blood in them. Look at that. And the whole freezer is full. Look at the mass on these antlers. that I noticed that they're all folded up on the end. They're still, these, these were cut off way before they were finished growing. They'll start to get, well, these are dimples, right? Yeah. And depending on the buyers, but generally speaking, you don't want much more than that for a dimple. Mm -hmm. The bigger the beam, the farther you can push that dimple. But generally speaking, this is as much dimpling as you want. You also look at the brow tines. If they start pointing up a bit or they kind of get a little pointy instead of looking like a sausage, yep. that's a sign that they need to be cut as well. And then you'll see there's just a slight line and that shows you you've cut it really well. That's your line of calcification. The government issues us these tags. They're each individually numbered. And then I record when we cut antler, which number goes on which antler. So the idea, it's that farm to fork idea. 
So no matter where they go in the world, you should be able to trace this antler back to Abel on this farm, wow. and even whether it's his right or left. Deer and Wildlife Stories is brought to you by Record Rack Deer Feed, the North American Deer Farmers Association, New Dart, the North American Deer Registry, Beam Fence Company, WinAtexasDeerFarm.com, Dr. Ray Favero's Whitetail Genetics, Headgear LLC, Superior Milk Replacer, Newport Laboratories, Advanced Deer Genetics, Whitetail Supplies, and by Keith Warren's Texas Hidden Springs Ranch. I noticed so many similarities between elk farming and deer farming. But the biggest thing that I notice is that elk farming has more revenues to be able to make money from. There's not another agricultural industry that has four outlets for one single animal. The great thing about the elk industry is there are multiple markets. The antler is harvested in, in May and June, and it's a uh, freeze-dried product that's used as a nutraceutical. It's people who own large parcels of property, they'll buy these high-end genetics that we produce, and it'll improve the genetics on their property. The meat market is another way. Just take a look at some of the meat products made from elk. You got ribeye steaks, elk patties, maple sticks, summer sausage, and more. These are just some of the ways that you make money on an elk farm. Is, is there a market for hard antler? I mean, you cut them off like that, there's a market for that. Is there a market for hard antler? Yeah, there's lots of buyers out for the hard antler. It's about, it's. It's not as profitable as the velvet. It's about fifteen dollars a pound. Well, this antler right here, how much that weigh? What do you think? I got, I got an idea. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I may be totally wrong. Twenty? I was gonna say fifteen, seventeen. Okay, say fifteen. And how much is it a pound? Fifteen dollars a pound. So do the math. That right there, a couple hundred bucks right there. Yeah. So what would that be in velvet? Fifty dollars a pound. You're kidding me. So it went from a couple of hundred dollars to, to a thousand. To a thousand. And you can do that every year? Every single year. We Holy smoke, I know what I'd be doing. I had no idea how much antlers were worth on these bulls. And the cool thing about it is, it's a renewable resource. Okay, well let's velvet a bull this morning. We've got uh, the blood stop, scab, alcohol disinfect everything, the tourniquet, clips, towels. We'll bring them in and let's go velvet them. Come on boy, you coming? Boy, lift up your head. When it comes to cutting the antlers off a bull, I think it's pretty amazing. It happens relatively quick. They'll put a tourniquet on the antlers to stop the blood flow. They'll sterilize the saw blade, and the antler removal comes quick. Okay, I got it. Once the antlers are removed, they'll take them and they'll measure them, they'll weigh them, and they'll set them in the freezer. Just keep the flies off, some flour, and then this is just a liquid scab. This is uh, once a year we get this. It's a renewable resource. Uh, $1,300, $1,500 a bull, two bulls per acre on marginal land. And when you look at the bulls when they come out after having their antlers removed, it looks like nothing happened at all. They're just missing their antlers. All right, thanks, boy. Thanks, Roach. See you next year. So this, is, uh, this bull has been cut already once. Uh, we cut early. So then they grow another set of antlers and uh, probably in another three, four weeks, we'll cut them again and we'll get another two, three, four pounds of uh, regrowth antler, which is a premium antler. It's more work, but it's an extra couple hundred bucks per animal per year. After the season's finished, we send it off to the markets and we have it dried down into a powder form or a chip form. This is the velvet and this is the antlers dried up. It loses about 75% of the weight. It's very porous as you can see. Well, they grind it up and you can see right here in the middle, this is ground up and it's a very fine powder. It comes in two different products. It comes in the product that is uh, for animals and primarily your house cat and your dog. If you have an aging uh, dog or cat that may have arthritis, uh, what the elk velvet does, it really helps with circulation and the blue is for humans. Uh, blue comes in a capsule form most people wind up taking two to three every single day and uh, it doesn't work instantly nothing really works instantly that's going to be worth a darn it takes several weeks for it to take effect but you will notice a difference it helps in circulation and if the circulation is uh, doing better you're going to feel better and your pet will too we have about 500 including the calves right now but let's go look at some bulls 
Okay. We had a lot of rain yesterday. So our hopper on the back is all weighted and measured so we can dole out exactly how much food I want to dole out. So these guys get around 100 pounds. not a self-feeder we're out there every day and that way we get to check the animals if you see someone with a bad our leg or then you take care of them take care yeah. of them yeah but most of these are pure manitobans uh there's a few of them that have a little bit of rocky mountain blood bred into them it's always a trial and error trying to figure out which which bulls you want to mix with your herd and stuff for the different outcomes that you're trying to get either from the velvet or the meat market or else the trophy market so we sort of breed for a combination of it all Closed captioning is brought to you by Seven Seas Whitetails. One of the most important things in elk ranching is keeping good records. No matter who goes out to tag or check calves, they take this with them. If something ever happened to this binder during calving, I'd probably have a nervous breakdown. So we have this on the front is all of our colors tags that we use that represent the sires. So we have our natural breeding and our backup and then all of our AIs that we use. And this is just a quick reference so we know what color of tag we're popping in the calf's ear. We found a new calf, so we're gonna go over and we're gonna tag it, sex it, and vaccinate it. We have a brand new calf, so we're just getting prepped to go tag it. We have to mix a couple vaccines, record all the tag numbers and the mum. My friends in the beef industry tell me about calving in January and February when it's real cold. The elk industry, you can see it's a beautiful day today and we're in the middle of our calving season. By the end of September, we're done with calving, we're done with antler harvest, we're done with breeding, and for the most part, winter is a simply a maintenance time period where we have very few things that we have to do. We simply make sure there's enough hay out there, we feed them and check them and make sure everything's okay, yeah. and because their metabolism oh, no slows way. down in the winter, the elk require very little winter maintenance. Okay, go find your mom. So last evening we had a couple cows in this in this group here that appeared to be in labor. So we're gonna go drive through this pen and see if we can find a couple of newborn calves. The Safety Zone Calf Catcher is designed to make calf catching easier and safer. It's designed so one person can do the work and you're safe at all times. You simply open up the front door catch a calf, step into the calf catcher from either an ATV or UTV, do your work. When you're all done, you open up the gate, let the calf out, you go on your way, and that mothering process takes place naturally. This right here, it's just basically their tear duct, but they open it up like this when they're really stressed or really excited. Yeah, our little bottle fed opens them up when it's feeding time, but normally that's a sign of stress. The big adult cows do it as well. Go find your mom for us. Go show us who your mom is. Well, there's no way that's a twin. That's a big, strong calf. Look at her. <laughs> that's sweet, pea. You know, on an elk farm, out of all the elk, there's got to be one that's special. And on this farm, there is. And I'll let Kelly tell you about it. So this is sweet pea. She was born in 1999. And when she was born, the vet had to pull her, broke her back leg, so we had to cast it. So she became very, very friendly. She's well loved. She's 805 pounds a couple weeks ago, which 600 pounds is a big cow. She's kind of a pet. Trev and I had our wedding pictures taken with her. I love her. My wife and kids absolutely adore her. She's special. She's spoiled rotten. Loves her sugar cubes. Hey, sweet pea. When we wean the calves in the September long weekend, we put her in with all the calves, usually the female calves and she calms them right down because she comes up and is this friendly the calves see that and they react to that and it just brings the whole herd down she kind of mothers them she goes to the trough so they follow her a big part of elk farming is spending time with the animals or animal husbandry um, we come out every single day even in winter and spend time with the animals they all get fed with the buggy every day and a big part of that is just seeing the animals, spending time with them, checking to make sure everybody's okay. But they get used to our voices, they get used to our movement, they get used to our vehicles. And that way when we do have to handle them, bring animals in for treatment or for calving issues or whatever it may be, they're not stressed. Stress is such a big thing with the elk. 
So it's just our way of keeping the herd calm and we actually call animals for that. If we have animals that do not stay calm or stay kind of crazy, we tend to send those animals to the meat industry just to keep our herd nice and calm. Now it's time for the Beam Fence Minute. I'm Mark Beam from Beam Fence Company. Today I'd like to talk to you about my roll master. This roll master is used to either pull up old wire that you want to get out of your field, or it's also used to, to roll up wire that you want to reuse. It works off pallet forks going on in front of your skidster or your tractor. The way it works is that when you want to stop and stretch your wire, you clamp the wire down, the weight of your unit then pulls ahead to stretch the wire. faster and safer way to put up wire. If you want more information about our product, you can contact us at beamfencecompany.com. Well, I'm Kevin Workmeister with WorkWeld Incorporated. And behind me, I have a 160 bushel elk feeder uh, designed easily to set up. Uh, one user can set it up in a very short period of time. Uh, pull a couple pins, you can fold out a rain awning, which gives you additional 16 inches of rain protection, helps keep the feed dry. Also, you can fold down a panel, which prevents the cows from going into the feeder. Calves can go in and get a specialty feed. Also, a ground opening lid. Open the lid from the ground with one hand, very easy to do. Feeder has four stabilizing jacks, two in the front, two in the back. Really user-friendly feeder. There's a lot of upside to elk ranching. It's the lifestyle. It's being able to work outside, be with animals that you love. It's able to spend time with your family. It's able to, to see something that you did with your bare hands and to be able to make a living doing it. In a busy world that we have today, that's a hard thing to find for a career, but it can be done with elk farming and elk ranching. Elk ranching is not for everyone. Uh, we love it, our family loves it. We enjoy li living with the animals taking care of them, they produce for us, we look after them. I can get up every morning, jump on my UTV, now every morning I can go out and I can hear an elk bugling right from my front doorstep. I kind of think we have a pretty dreamy life out here. I grew up on a mixed farm, on a, my grandparents' farm with my mom and dad, and I always felt like it, I wanted my kids to grow up on that sort of same lifestyle. I don't want them in the house all summer long. I don't want them being gamers on video games all the time. I want them outside, I want them dirty. Even when the farm gets frustrating and all of our friends are away on camping trips and sometimes we think, ah, are we really doing the right thing? But when I see the kids outside and loving animals and, and knowing what hard work is and understanding that sometimes it doesn't always go well with animals. When we send our animals, unfortunately, for meat, it's upsetting to us. We put everything we can into these animals. It is a, it is a business, but our animals are very special to us. We look after them as they're one of our own. Go around, find an elk ranch locally, and talk to them. They'll talk, they'll take you in, help you out, put you in the right direction. You know, people live a very hectic lifestyle nowadays. I mean, they work in the city, they're busy, their blood pressure's up, and they're looking for something to do other than their typical city job. Elk farming may be for you. You know, elk farming, in my opinion, after visiting elk farms and getting to know the people, it's very therapeutic. I mean, you take a look at it, it's a great lifestyle. Here's a shed I found yesterday. Wow. <laughs> That's just a... Look at that. Just out in the bush. That's a nice deer. That's just a wild deer living around here. That's good. That'll be an average. One of the most important management tools a elk rancher has, or a, a heck of wildlife manager has, is an eight foot game fence. This is the exact same kind of wire that I've used on my place. It comes in a 330 foot roll. It's made by Stay Tough Fence Company out of Texas. All right, this one is from Dylan. He's from Oklahoma. He says he's about to retire and he's considering getting into either deer or elk farming. Which one would I recommend? Dylan, that's a really good question. It all depends upon what you want to accomplish. I mean, there are more outlets for the end product with elk farming than deer farming, but both are lucrative. So I would suggest you contact 
elk farmers in your area, deer farmers in your area, go visit them, get to know them, and then you make that decision yourself. Walking through this fuel stop in the heartland of America, I look at all the different products we have on the shelf, and I know that there's no other place on earth that we have all the things that we have in our country. And it makes me realize, you know, there's a lot of things that are taken for granted. I think a couple of things that are really taken for granted in our country are agriculture and farming. I think without it, we'd have a bunch of skinny people. I mean, think about it. Agriculture and farming feeds everybody and elk farming, elk ranching is a cool thing. If you'd like more information on elk ranching, all you need to do is just log on to my website. I'll have a direct link to every single one of the sponsors that made today's show possible. And I'd like to thank you for watching. Excuse us. Beep, beep. Pardon me. Can you say college tuition? Can you say house payments? Can you say ranch payments? That's what y'all represent. You also represent freedom, landowner rights. That's pretty cool. If you'd like more information about elk farming, go online to elkranching.org.